So Christmas is one of the most celebrated holidays all over the world. No matter what country you're from, Christmas is one of the most celebrated holidays of the year. It's estimated that 2 billion people celebrate Christmas around the world each December 25th. It's a lot of people. 2 billion people around the world will celebrate on December 25th the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, many people have different responses to Christmas. Many people celebrate different things around Christmas. And what we're going to look at today is the different responses that people can have to Christmas. It's estimated that this year, Christmas is tomorrow, it's estimated this year that around $24 billion will be spent this year on Christmas. How many, how many of you have contributed to that number so far? Yeah, we've all contributed. How many of you are planning on spending some more today? Did you venture off into Martin Luther King yesterday? <laughs> it was a dangerous world out there. I was, uh, I was at Rouse's and uh, it felt like I was playing Frogger. I mean, it's just like you got to find your way through to get your buggy through. But people respond in many different ways to Christmas. And, uh, and so we're good. We can, you guys can stop playing. We're good. Um, so f- for some, Christmas is about family and friends and and spending quality time together, and that's a good thing, right? Family and friends. After, for only a short while, though, right? And then it's time to go home, right? But for some people, Christmas is about Santa Claus. It's about sitting on the lap of an old man and taking pictures, which I find is a little creepy, but that's just between me and you. Um, but as believers, Christmas is completely different. As Christians, every year when we gather to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, God becoming man. We are gathering, we are setting this time aside, this season aside for a very different reason. The last song we sung is the reason, is that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords and he was born in a manger, he was born to die, to, to, to spread out his arms on the cross and then to, to rise from the dead for our justification. This is the, the heart of the incarnation for us as Christians. And so there are different responses that people will have. To Christmas. And in our text today, we're going to look at the text that was read about by our children. Didn't they do a great job? Amen. Our, our worship team, everybody, the violinist, the cello player, they did a wonderful job today. But in our text, we're going to see three distinct responses to Christmas. Three distinct responses to Christmas in the text about the wise men. So if you have your Bible, let's look at Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 18. I'm going to kind of skip around those that are putting the slides on the screen. It may not be exactly what you have up there, but it says this in Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the, Christ was to be, to, where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed by their own country, to their own country, by another way. So three distinct responses to Christ, to Christmas, three distinct responses to Christmas in this text about the wise men. Some people respond with hostility. Hostility. 
That's a response to Christmas, hostility. Did you notice in the text in Matthew chapter 2, it says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and he, he ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So he's, he's wanting to act like he's here to worship the king of the Jews. And so he says, hey, hey, do you know where he's at so I can come and worship this king? If you look at verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. So Herod was hostile to Christ. And that's one of the responses that people can have towards Christmas, hostility, anger. And you see Herod, Herod was threatened by the news of a king. Herod was an illegitimate king. He was an illegitimate king of the Jews. And so when he heard about a king of the Jews being born as the prophets had spoken, he heard the news that had traveled. For him, he was hostile towards Christ because of his authority and his throne. He felt threatened. He felt threatened. You know, Herod was a harsh king. It was said of Herod that as his death was approaching, that he had to instruct over 3,000 people. He instructed them, hey, after I die, I want you to mourn for me after my death because unless he would have instructed people to mourn for his death, no one would have mourned for Herod's death. That's how harsh of a king Herod was. He was harsh. He was hostile to Christ. Herod's response, I believe, represents, represents those who are unwilling to submit to God's authority. That's hostility, Right? When we think about Christ, we think about Christmas, we think about him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of all creation who put on flesh. When we think about hostility towards Christ and Christmas, some of you may think, well, I don't, I'm, you know, I, I don't know how people can be angry about Christmas. Everything's red and rosy and presents and giving. And, and so I'm not talking about that type of hostility. I'm talking about a hostility that is unwilling to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because he's not just a baby born in a major. He is the risen Savior who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so we're thinking about hostility towards Christ. It's, an, it's, a, it's a hostility that refuses to submit to Christ as king. And King Herod represents all of us who would want to have ourselves as the king over our lives. Mark chapter 8 says this. Jesus says, in calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. So why did King Herod not want to inquire about Jesus? Because he wanted to eliminate Jesus. He wanted to eliminate any threat to his throne. And Jesus was a threat to his, his autonomy. Jesus was a threat to his control. And this is hostility towards Christ. And all of us, listen, all of us have that same fight from the beginning of our lives. Autonomy, control, self-government, hostility, and hostility if it's threatened. Do you guys follow that? All of us from our birth, though, though we, we don't like to think about that with our little kids, but all of us from our birth, we are hostile to anyone who threatens our self-government and our rights. If you don't believe me, tomorrow morning, give your precious kiddos all those nice presents that you bought when you contributed to the $24 million and take it from them and watch the hostility. <laughs> it will rear its ugly head in that two-year-old, the cute little two-year-old that sat on Santa's lap. Hostility. All of us have that desire. It's born into all of us. We are born with a sinful nature. So inside of all of us, we want self-government. We want our way. And it goes all the way back to the garden. Self-government is the idol of our day. And actually, it's been the idol since the beginning. It's what's been worshipped since the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden by God, and God gave them rules and commands to live by, Adam and Eve said no, just like Herod said no. Adam and Eve said, no, I will not worship that king. I am the king of my life. I want autonomy and self-government. I will be my own king. And so like Herod, still today, we all fight to protect our seat of authority. So the question I ask for all of us is, is what about you? What about us? You know, at the core of a, of a proper response to the gospel is self-denial. Not my way. 
not my plans. You alone are king. You alone are king. And Herod was unwilling to respond to Christ in that way. And many here today, many around the world are unwilling to respond to Christ that way. They're unwilling to submit when he, you know, Christianity is not this, this message of, of easy believism where we come in and we can just believe whatever you want and you believe your version of Christianity and you believe your version and you believe your version. Really, there's only one version of Christianity. It's the version of submission to Christ as Lord. That's Christianity that he is the risen king. And so we, we may think that that's what Christianity is and all these different ways in which you can come, but really there's only one way. You see that he's Lord of all and he's, Lord, he's not Lord at all, right? And so that, that's really the first response is hostility because that's what Jesus represents. It's not just a baby in a manger. It's a king to be worshiped. For some people, hostility is their response. No, I, I don't want that. I don't want that authority in my life. For some people, it's not hostility. For some people, it's indifference. They're like, hey, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not hostile to Christ. He can do his thing. I'll do mine. I, I'm just indifferent. You ever been indifferent about something? Indifference. That's, that, that's another response that people have. Look back to the text in Matthew 2. Let's look at some indifference in Matthew 2. So Matthew 2, back to the text, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. What did the prophet Micah say? And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So notice, who did Herod go to to find out about where this king of the Jews was to be born? Who did he go to? He went to the people that should have known and actually that did know. He went to the scribes and the Pharisees. The the Bible says, Jesus says that the scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses' seat. Now, what does it mean when Jesus says that the scribes and the Pharisees sat on the seat of Moses? Moses in the Old Testament represents the law of God. You remember, if you, if you study the Old Testament, Moses, Moses got the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and so Moses represents the law of God. And so Jesus talked about the scribes and Pharisees and said that they sit on the seat of the law, meaning that they are the caretakers of the law and of the prophets of the Old Testament. And so if Herod was going to go to anybody about the news of a Messiah king being born, the people he should go to were the scribes and Pharisees. And notice what their response is, because they knew. They knew the prophecy. They knew what was going to happen, but they were indifferent. They don't do anything about it. There is no record in this account, in any part of the New Testament, of the scribes and Pharisees going to worship the king, going to even, not even just worship, but to even inquire. I find it's always shocking when someone knows better but they still get it wrong. You ever experienced that? People know better, but they still get it wrong. This is the indifference of the scribes and Pharisees. It's this nonchalance type of attitude. Listen, all of Jerusalem was troubled over the rumor of a king born in Bethlehem. Everyone was troubled. Everyone was stirred up in Jerusalem. Have have you heard? It, It might be a fulfillment of the prophecy in the Old Testament. It might be a fulfillment. Everyone was stirred up about it. Everyone except the ones who should have been stirred up. Even a pagan king, like King Herod, he was interested, but it was only because he didn't want to submit to a new king. He wanted to be king. But the ones who should have been searching the prophecies when they heard the news, they should have been interested in going to at least inquire, but they were indifferent, lack of concern, apathy, lack of enthusiasm. We don't see anything of that. You know, there's a story of a, of a husband and wife They went flying. They're flying home from an overseas trip, and they're in the plane, and all of a sudden, the plane banks steeply to one direction, and everyone in the plane begins to freak out. And so the pilot comes on to the intercom and tries to calm the situation and says, hey, we, we want you to put your seatbelts on. We're going to experience a little turbulence here. And so everyone's a little nervous. They don't really know what's going on exactly, and so... Uh, the stewardess comes and they, she gets on the speaker and, and she tells the crowd that's in the plane, she says, here's what's happening. We've had a bomb threat. And so we have turned the plane around and we're headed back to the airport 
to land. And here's what we want you to do. We, when, when we land, we want you to get off of the plane immediately. We don't want you to grab any bags, any packages, nothing under your seat. We want you to take off your seatbelt. We want you to go to the exits that are nearest you, the closest exit near you. Get off of the plane. So the plane lands at the city that they had just left from. They get down. All the exits begin to open. And would you know it, no concern apathetic, can't listen to instructions, can't listen, there's, there's a bomb threat, what do people do? They begin to grab their bags off of the overhead bin space, they're getting under their seat, they're getting all of their belongings, isn't, isn't that what we would do? I think we'd probably do the same thing. Some of us think, oh no, I, I, think, I, I think I'd run off. No, no, I think we'd be just like those people, grabbing our bags. Yes, there's something important going on. Yes, there's a bomb threat, but I think our natural reaction is to ignore reality to ignore rights and what's right in front of us. And this is what these scribes and Pharisees did. They knew the law. They knew the prophets. They knew who Christ was. They, they knew that something was going to happen according to the word of prophecy. The Old Testament about a, 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 a king born in Bethlehem. But they were so indifferent, they couldn't even make their way to see. All of Jerusalem was in an uproar over the news. But you know what I think happens is that people can grow indifferent towards Christ. Why do, how do we grow indifferent towards Christ? What about us? How do we grow indifferent? I I think we grow indifferent towards Christ because I got to get my kids up in the morning. I got to get them out the door to school Monday through Friday. And I have a job I have to run off to. And I, I have family gatherings. And I have soccer. And I have basketball. And I have this event and that event. And I have that wedding to go to. And I have that and this and that. And, and we're so busy in our life. We're running 150 miles an hour here, there, and everywhere. And it's not that we're hostile to Christ. Christ is good. And, and I'll come to a Christmas service or I'll go to an Easter service. But, but, but for most of us, we're so so busy that we can't stop to take the time when the shining light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and his gospel is in front of us. We, we're indifferent because we're distracted by the things that take up our time during the week. So here's some questions for us to ponder this morning. Is Jesus a once a year distraction from our regularly scheduled programming? Are our lives so busy that we don't have time to stop and ponder the prophetic realities of Christ? Listen, just just one little thought to think about. The prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, prophesied not about the birth of Christ, but he prophesied about the death of Christ. And if you read Isaiah, I challenge you, when you get home, you read Isaiah chapter 53, and you consider what you know about Christ and his death and the cross, and you consider, who could that prophecy be about other than Jesus? And then I want you to know this, that that prophecy that was written about Christ was written 700 years before his birth, which is what we're celebrating today. Are we so busy and so indifferent to eternal matters that we won't stop and ponder who Christ is. Let's, start, stop, let's, let's have people start messing with our money and our taxes and our kids. We're not indifferent anymore, right? But there's something more important than our taxes and our money and our kids. It's called heaven and eternity. May we not be like the white, may we not be like the scribes and Pharisees who are indifferent here. Listen, I'm gonna challenge you with this statement. I want you to lean in here just for a moment, listen. Christmas is not about stopping and savoring life. Christmas is not about stopping and savoring life. For so many of the people, that's what it's about. Stop and drink the hot cocoa. Stop and drink the coffee. And I've baked a 50 pecan pies since October. Right? It's not about the pecan pie. It's not about stopping and savoring life. Christmas is about stopping and savoring Christ. That's what Christmas is about. And may we not be indifferent or distracted from what it is all about. Indifference, lack of interest. You know what is is sad? 
is that you know, there are those who are hostile towards Christ. And then there's those who are indifferent. But here's what I tell you, indifference leads to hostility. Indifference leads to hostility. How do I know that? Well, the, the Bible shows it. Did you see earlier when we read in Matthew? It says that scribes and Pharisees gave the news to Herod. Yeah, 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 the prophets said that. Yeah, that's something going on over there. I mean, if you want to go check it out, that, that's cool, right? They, they told him, yeah, the prophet confirmed what you're, what you're inquiring about. But notice what happened to their response. Look at Matthew 26. Fast forward. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they may put him to death. There's people that are hostile to Christ. They don't want to submit to his kingship and his lordship. There's also people who are so indifferent that eventually they will become hostile as well. Scribes and priests were unwilling to seek any further knowledge concerning a king born in Bethlehem. And still today, people are indifferent, and that indifference, that indifference can lead to hostility as well. So, hostility, indifference. How do people respond? Hostile, indifferent. Some people, however, some people, however, worship. That's the third response, worship. Look back to the text. Who's the worshiping people? It's the people that are gazing at the stars. Those are the worshiping people. Look at Matthew chapter 2. It says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. They're not hostile like Herod. They're not indifferent like the scribes and Pharisees. They have one singular purpose, to find that child that was born king of the Jews so they can worship him. The magi, the wise men, they they were pagan. They looked for truth in the stars, but they were seekers. They, 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 They were trying to figure out who God was, and God revealed himself to them. Here's what I'll tell you. Worship begins with seeking. Worship begins with seeking. It begins with the desire to know the truth. How many of you in here have a desire to know the truth? Well, worship begins with seeking, with a desire to know the truth. And the wise men came to Jerusalem seeking to find the king of the Jews so they could worship him. You know, what's interesting is that when they came to Jerusalem, they found, they found no answers. They went to King Herod. King Herod's hostile. He says, I'm not going to, look, I don't know where he's at. And there's this trick, this thing going on between Herod and the wise men. He thinks that they tricked him and and then, and then the, the, they can't go to the scribes and Pharisees because the scribes and Pharisees are indifferent. There's no help in Jerusalem, but they're seeking. And something amazing happened next. Look back to the text, Matthew 2, 9. After listening to the king, the wise men went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. That's <laughs> some good news. You know what that good news is? is that if you are a genuine seeker of truth, the Lord will place a star. He'll light the path for you to get to Christ. That's some good news. You know, the Bible really points us to that in Romans chapter 1. The Bible says in Romans 1 that God has made it abundantly clear in all of his creation that he is real and that there is a God. Some of you may come here today, you said, I, I'm not hostile to Christ. I'm not hostile to a little baby born in a manger. I don't even know if I believe in God. I want you to know the fact that you're here is not an accident. And God has placed in creation, in the order of his creation, the star that you need to recognize that there is a God and that you are not an accident, that you have divine purpose, that you have a divine calling, and that you are placed here not because of random, the random accident of evolution. No, you are here because God created you in his image, in his likeness. He put breath in your lungs. And God has given you enough evidence to recognize that he is real, and he's wanting you to pursue him. And just like with these wise men, God placed a star so they would know where to go. Jeremiah 29 verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. Any seekers here today, are you trying to seek after God? He's going he's to help you find them. 
Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God, whoever would draw near, whoever would seek him, must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So you, you know what the truth is, is that we may think that we're seekers, but you know who, who the real seeker is? It's God. God's the seeker. God has from the beginning been a seeker. He pursues us. He reveals himself to us in creation. He's been seeking us, trying to get our attention to wake us up out of the hostility, wake us up out of the indifference so that we would seek after him, so we would pursue after him. There's so many of us that we have such a, a deep hole in our heart. We, we try to fill it with money and possessions and relationships and experiences. And we live with this ache and this hole in our heart. And, and we only really fill it when we're, when, when, when we're alone and we're in our bed. It's at night and all the noise has stopped and all the work has stopped and all the pressure has stopped. And we're by ourselves and we realize, we realize in those moments, in those moments that certainly life is not just about all the things I've been doing. There's got to be more. And those thoughts... Or the Lord drawing you, pulling you, saying, yes, there is so much more. Yes, created you. Yes, I made you and I sent my son to die for you. God will pursue us. He has pursued us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. So how did the Magi respond? And really, when God seeks us, we have to respond. When God places a star, the, the bright light of the gospel, when he shines his light on us in front of us to see where truth is, we have to respond, don't we? you got to respond. How did the Magi respond? Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced exceedingly. What does exceeding great joy look like? You're a two-year-old tomorrow morning. You're four-year-old tomorrow morning, right? Exceeding great joy. I, I can't really demonstrate it with my body. You might laugh at me, but I think it's something like jumping up and down. I think it's something like, I think it's something like falling on your face. Exceeding great joy. That's how they responded. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. He would have been around two years old at this point. And they fell down and they worshiped him. And what did they do? They opened their treasures. They offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. What does gold represent? Why why'd they give him gold? Gold's royalty. It represents royalty. By bringing a gift of gold, the wise men showed that they did indeed consider Jesus a king. What about the frankincense? Well, frankincense was very expensive. It was burned as incense in the worship of a deity. And so that I don't think there's any mistake here with this offering of frankincense. They are declaring that they believe that this is not just a king, an earthly king. This is an eternal king. A king that was born. The eternal king of creation. And then what about myrrh? Myrrh was an aromatic spice that was used for burial purposes. And you know what I think this is? Prophetically, the wise men were preparing Jesus for his death. Gifts suitable for a king, the eternal king who had put on flesh. Exceedingly great joy, exceedingly great joy, exceedingly great joy for worship is the only resp proper response when we see Christ. And when we come into his presence, when his light shines upon us. So, so what about us today? As, as, as we conclude, as we wrap up here, what about us today? Are we indifferent? Are we hostile? Are we unwilling to submit? to God as king, to Christ as king? Is our indifference moving us towards hostility? Are we so busy and distracted we don't have time for Christ? Or are we worshipers? Has the light of Christ shone in your heart and destroyed every distraction and every excuse? Have you seen him today? Have you seen Christ today? The face of Jesus Christ, the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. On December 17th, 1903, I shared this story at the Home of Christian Christmas Place. So if you've heard it, bear with me, but most of you haven't heard this. On December 17th, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made their first flight of an airplane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And you know, they've been trying for a long time to fly, right? Many different roadblocks they've experienced and they finally fly approximately 120 feet in the air 
And they're so excited, they want to send a telegram to their sister, Catherine, who lives in another city, their hometown. So they send a telegram to their sister, Catherine, and it reads, we've finally done it. Stop. We have flown 120 feet. Stop. We will be home for Christmas. Stop. Catherine cannot believe it. They finally have flown. For the first time in human history, uh, men have flown. Men don't fly. Only if they create a plane, they can fly. But for the first time in human history, they flew. And so Catherine runs to the local newspaper, and she brings the news, this wonderful news that, that they had finally flown, and she goes and tells the editor, reads the telegram to the editor, and the editor with this news, the greatest news in human history that men had flown, and the editor looks at the telegram, and he reads it silently, and, and then he says, oh, that's nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. What, what's the point? point is, is that they missed it. That's a true story. They missed it. He missed it. He missed it. That's nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. Not, oh my goodness, they flew. They did it. I know these boys. We grew up with them. They've been trying really hard. We thought they were naive and ignorant. We thought they were like Noah building an ark, right? The rain's never going to come. The, the plane's never going to get off. They finally did it. No. Oh, that's nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. Don't miss it this year. Don't let another moment pass by where the wonder of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ doesn't radically change your life. Don't miss it. Don't let another moment pass by. Don't let another moment pass by in your life. And it's not just about December 25th. It's about every day. Don't let another moment pass by where the incarnation doesn't radically change your life. God loves you. And he sent his son to die for you. And that is what Christmas is about. That is what the incarnation is about. And don't miss that news. Don't leave today thinking about anything. All the other stuff we did was great. The dances. The dancers did a phenomenal job. And the kids did a great job. And the music was wonderful. And, and the sermon, you guys have sat through it. And I'm almost done. <laughs> but don't miss the point. Tomorrow, when you're exchanging those gifts, the point of the gift exchange is that it represents the gift that God has given us in his son. It's not about the bike. It's not about the Xbox. Don't let another moment pass by where the wonder of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ doesn't radically change your life. As 2 Corinthians 4 says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen.